morning, ladies and gentlemen. How are we today? Good, number one. Oh, excellent, excellent. Thank you. What a beautiful day it's going to be. We had beautiful showers last night, blessings from heaven above. And uh, so it's, uh, and I'm a morning person, so I was in bed about seven o'clock last night to get my beauty sleep. <laughs> the wife woke me up a few times. Can you get the cat outside? <laughs> But no, it's good. It's great to see some familiar faces here this morning. And uh, introductions of myself. My name is Walter Maguire. My Aboriginal name is Jindin Yeh. I am a Wajak Bibberman Nyunga Maman. Nichigalaka Buja Wajak Nyunga Bibberman. So I'm a first man of this land on which we sit today. And we're going to have this beautiful food and uh, conversations. And um, so my job here this morning is as a traditional owner of the first people, the Wajak Nyunga Bibman people, is to welcome you here to the land of the Wajak Nyunga Bibman people. So Yanba Kayanuka Yakin Nicha Nichinga Laka Buja Wajak Nyunga Bibman. Kura Kurya Laka Demanga Mamanga, Kain Mamaninman, Balapa Yaki Nicha. Nalgunga Bri Yaki Nicha, Manda, Kaigan, Nalakangup Mort, Weep, Mijiguru, Yagan, Nalakangup Mort. Well, I've been doing what Jenga, you are cool, looking like a billion double year again. I like a new more one game and what by Jenga. Well, I want a non work call, curl up. I like a genuine and no cabruin, and we're in genuine and norca. I like a wagon co op, curl up near gap. Yeah, 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 I can niche a genuine, genuine, no comam and your comba. No look at the line, boy, a poor, catch a no comam and inman, no look at demaga, mamaga, no look at you are cool, meaning nature. Charmot, Australians. Could you bang up by another brick water in Nunaka Carlacor, Nunaka Court, Kurunga, New Bridge, put on the work and get a knock in Yeni? So, ladies and gentlemen, it's great to see you here on this beautiful day on the lands of the Wajak Nyunga Bibman people. And as I stand here and welcome you, we welcome people of good heart and good spirit and good minds. And as we stand here on country, we work together. The history of this land is a sad history for some of us, especially the first traditional owners. But we stand here today, we are many, many cultures from many, many parts of the world. Your families have come here, you've come here, you, came, you named this place your home. And as we sit here and work together, we create a great country, a better country today and tomorrow. So, also I sing you a song of blessings from a place we call Kakadup. I know most people have been to Kakadup because it's also the same place we call Kings Park the home of the trapdoor spider. So may this song be a blessing for you. And it's one that we do sing and present to people before we come to gatherings like this. So when we go out and about that uh, the great spirit keeps us safe with our business. And also as we travel across this, this roads and uh, take us home safely to our families and loved ones. So Ladies and gentlemen, take care on the lands of the Wajak Nyunga Bibman people. And may the great spirit bless you and keep you safe. Take your home safely to your families. And if you see us on the river, say hello. I could be having a kangaroo tail. It tastes better than a shrimp on a barbie, I'll tell you that now. <laughs> God bless you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. I have to confess that I found that uh, a little bit emotional. It's been just over three months since we last had an in-person event. Uh, we were 
able in the beginning of March to host the, the High Commissioner from India here. Um, and to see faces again in three dimensions is, is heartening, but to hear the wonderful cadence of the Nunga language and to be welcome to this country uh, is something that I've missed greatly. My name is Gordon Flake. I'm the CEO of the Perth US Asia Center, and it is my great honor to welcome you all here today and to add my welcome to that of Walters. In a sign of things to come, in addition to this socially distanced audience here in person at the University of Western Australia, this event is also live streaming to well over 250 people, not just here in Western Australia, but across the nation and internationally. I acknowledge the presidents of the, the, the governor of Western Australia, Kim Beasley, uh, the Minister of Defense, uh, Senator Linda Reynolds, CSC, and the Minister for Defense Issues, Melissa Price. There are many others that I should recognize, including the leadership of our host institution, the University of Western Australia, but they'll be introduced in just a minute in the program. I must, however, acknowledge that it is a special privilege to have in the room here today uh, four current and former ministers of defense. Uh, in addition to the minister herself and the governor, we've got uh, Professor Stephen Smith here at the University of Western Australia and, and Mr. David Johnson. Uh, so it, it uh, is a traditional, particular honor to have them all here together with us. I would also acknowledge that we have the Consul Generals uh, from the United States, from Japan, from India, from Indonesia with us, and we welcome all of you as well. Here in Perth, in her home state, the minister really needs no introduction. However, for the sake of our, our online audience, Minister Reynolds was sworn in as the Minister for Defense on the 29th of May, 2019. She previously served as Minister for Defense Issues. It seems like we've got a bit of a lock on these positions here in Western Australia, ministers. Uh, um, she was elected to the Australian Senate in 2014, and prior to her time in Parliament, served for 29 years in the Australian uh, Army as a reserve officer. Ms. Reynolds was the first woman in the Australian Army Reserves to be promoted to the rank of Brigadier and was awarded the Conspicuous Service Cross. Senator Reynolds holds a, a particularly passionate position as an advocate for Western Australia. And we at the Perth US Asia Center in the six and a half years of our existence have benefited tremendously for that passion, which is not limited to her security background and her defense issues. Uh, she has been a speaker at our annual In the Zone Conference, which we do with the with the University of Western Australia on, on maritime issues, on rare earth issues, uh, and has been someone that we've relied on very heavily. We here at UWA and at the Perth US Asia Center are proud to consider her one of our most high profile, active and generous supporters. Um, we are, are gathered here this morning to hear a speech from the minister following the joint launch between the minister and the prime minister just this last Wednesday of a 2020 defense strategic update and a 2020 force structure plan. After her remarks, the minister has agreed to sit down for a short in conversation with me and then to have a in conversation or a question and answer period, both with our in-house audience, audience and with questions that were submitted in advance from those who are watching online. Uh, anything further I could say would, would uh, be redundant to the, the speech that the minister has to offer. So I'd ask you all, both online and in person, to join me in welcoming Minister Linda Reynolds. Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Gordon, for that uh, wonderful introduction and good morning, everyone. But firstly, can I say uh, to Walter, thank you very much for that wonderful uh, welcome to country. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, who are the traditional custodians on the land on which we, we meet. And I also pay my respects to their elders past, present, and also emerging. But as Minister for Defence, I also pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and women who have served our nation with such great distinction in both in times of peace and also in war. And I thank them for their service. Let me sincerely thank my very good friend, Professor Gordon Flake, who is the CEO of the Perth US Asia Centre. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you all here this morning. Uh, there is a long list of acknowledgements, but I would like to go through and acknowledge all of the very distinguished uh, guests we have here today. First of all is His Excellency, the Honourable Kim Beasley, AC, Governor of Western Australia, who is one of the four ex-defence ministers here in this room. And I thank him for his enduring interest in defence matters and also for being so kind to me uh, on becoming Minister for Defence. Uh, the Honourable Melissa Price, MP, Minister for Defence Industry, uh, and the four, two former Ministers for Defence, Professor Stephen Smith, and also David Johnson, welcome to you both. Uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Senior ADF Representatives, 
Ms Rebecca Brown, Acting Director General of the West Australian Department of Premier and Cabinet, current and former parliamentary colleagues, representatives of our great Western Australian companies, distinguished academics uh, from all of West Australia's universities. And finally, a very warm welcome to Professor Amit Chakma, the brand new Vice Chancellor of the University of Western Australia. And it's his very first day on the job. So welcome to Western Australia. <laughs> Uh, as Gordon said, uh, it, it is a return uh, for me to the Perth US Asia Centre. Gordon, you and your team make a globally significant contribution to regional research, scholarship and also policy development. Uh, this is particularly so with your laser-like focus on the Indo part of the Indo-Pacific. This morning, I want to talk to you about some issues that I know are on all of our minds especially given the very significant national defence announcements the Prime Minister and I made last week. Issues that are central to the Indian Ocean region, to defence, and also to the great state of Western Australia, which I know are shared passions amongst all of us here today. But let me be clear, this is not a new defence white paper. Rather, it is a clear-eyed assessment of our strategic environment and how the Australian government is responding. In August last year here in Perth at the Indo-Pacific Conference, I spoke about the significance of the Indo-Pacific and also the Indian Ocean. I also foreshadowed emerging regional challenges. And today I will revisit both in the context of the Defence Strategic Update, but with a particular focus on the Indian Ocean and also ASEAN. The Indian Ocean region is politically diverse with an under, underdeveloped regional architecture. Australia has significant interests and also territories in the Indian Ocean region and an increasingly significant role to play. Our equities are clear and they are long-standing. Firstly, our exclusive economic zone with a total uh, marine area of 10 million square kilometres it extends deep into the Indian Ocean. This includes the strategically valuable territories of Christmas, and, uh, Christmas Island and the Cocos Keeling Islands. Secondly, the Indian Ocean is home to five of Australia's top 15 trading partners, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand. And thirdly, 40% of our nation's goods export by value depart from Western Australia. Australia's strategic environment across all our three oceans is complex, is increasingly contested, and is changing rapidly. It has changed more rapidly than anticipated in the 2016 Defence White Paper. And let me be quite blunt. The world we all grew up in is no more. Major power competition, militarisation, disruptive technological changes, and new threats are all making our region less safe. Some countries are modernising their militaries and increasing their preparedness for war, for conflict, I should say. Some nations are increasingly employing coercive tactics that fall below the threshold of armed conflict. Cyber attacks, foreign interference, and economic pressure seek to exploit the gray area between peace and war. In the grey zone, when the screws are tightened, influence becomes interference. Economic cooperation becomes coercion. Investment becomes entrapment. Transnational threats also remain. Terrorism, violent extremism, organised crime and people smuggling. And the COVID-19 pandemic is still very much an active and an unpredictable threat. One that is dramatically altering the global economic and strategic landscape. As the Prime Minister observed in his speech last Wednesday, he said this, we need to prepare for a post COVID world that is poorer, that is more dangerous, and that is more disorderly. All of these pressures are contributing to rising uncertainty and tension. The prospect of high intensity conflict in the Indo-Pacific, while still unlikely, is less remote than in the past. 
and we must adapt to these new challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, challenges and threats are inherent to any nation's security environment. And today Australia faces challenges and threats that are more fluid, more nuanced and are rapidly evolving. At the same time, they are becoming more intense and more hostile. As I've said many times before, the very first priority of this government, indeed of any Australian government, is to protect the nation's security, its sovereignty, and therefore its citizens. We must do this while upholding the values and the principles that define us as a nation and define us as a people. These are the principles that underpin the 2020 Defence Strategic Update and the 2020 Force Structure Plan. I believe the Defence Strategic Update is a timely response to our evolving security environment. The Companion Force Structure Plan outlines the capabilities Defence will acquire and also, very clearly, the cost to Australian taxpayers. Let me outline the three new objectives that underpin Australia's resolve. They are to shape, to deter, and to respond. Firstly, to shape our strategic environment. Secondly, to deter action against Australia's interests. And thirdly, to respond with credible military force when required. Shaping our strategic environment means working with our friends, our partners, and our allies to shape an Indo-Pacific where the rules-based order is respected and observed. It means championing the independence, resilience and sovereignty of all states in our region, be they large or small. It means resolving disputes peacefully and without coercion. It means cooperation and healthy competition, not confrontation and conflict. To achieve this, the Defence Cooperation Programme will focus its attention on our immediate region as part of the whole of government Pacific step up. By this, I mean the area ranging from northeastern Indian Ocean through maritime and mainland Southeast Asia to Papua New Guinea and to the Southwest Pacific. In short, shaping is all about working with regional partners to preserve our shared values. Now I'll turn to our objectives of deterring and responding. The FSP details how defence will sharpen its capabilities across five domains. They are maritime, land, air, information and cyber, and space. Over the next decade, the government is investing $270 billion in these defence capabilities. This locks in our long-term funding commitments foreshadowed in the 2016 White Paper. Defence, and Australian defence industry rely on funding stability, especially during this very challenging time for our nation's economy. Defence funding remains decoupled from GDP, avoiding the need to regularly adjust plans and purchases in response to GDP fluctuations. We've committed to the following, $75 billion in maritime, 60, uh, sorry, $55 billion in land, $65 billion in air, $15 billion in information and cyber, $7 billion in space, and $50 billion in enterprise capabilities, infrastructure, and also in ICT. Together, these investments will deliver more potent capabilities to deter and, if necessary, to respond. The ADF's ability to act with greater independence is inextricably linked to a sovereign, sustainable, and secure Australian defence industry. And I'm very proud to be part of a government that unashamedly backs Australian companies and Australian workers to deliver sovereign industrial defence capability. This is absolutely critical to building deterrent capabilities and our ability to respond with credible force. Defence directly employs 116,000 Australians in both the ADF and also the public service. This accounts for approximately 30% of Defence's annual budget. But it's, it, it's much bigger than that, much, much bigger. Early analysis shows that around 15,000 Australian companies and some 70,000 workers across our economy are already benefiting from our investment, both directly and indirectly. 
and this is growing rapidly. All states and territories must contribute to this truly national endeavour. And as a West Australian, uh, I am very proud that West Australia is playing an increasingly important role in that. Not just in our nation's security, but also in the development of our sovereign industrial defence capabilities. We are an entrepreneurial and a highly innovative state. We understand capital, we understand mega projects, and we understand big infrastructure. We are true industrial pioneers here in the West which dates back well before the first shipment of iron ore from Western Australia in 1966. We're well experienced in engineering and high-end fabrication and collaboration is a long-standing practice for our industries and our wonderful universities. Our instinct for talent, our instinct and talent for innovation are demonstrated across adjacent and complementary industries right across our state. That includes the resources sector, naval shipbuilding, space situational awareness, autonomy, cyber security, AI, and drone technology, and the list goes on and on. But a stronger and more integrated West Australian sovereign industrial and research industry is more important than ever to our nation. As a result, in Western Australia over the coming decade, there will be a $2.5 billion investment to refresh and further develop defence facilities. And this includes at Irwin Barracks, Defence Establishment Harold E. Holt, RAF Base Curtin, RAF Base Pierce, RAF Base Learmont, Yampi Sound Training Area, HMAS Stirling, and Campbell Barracks. Local industry involvement in the delivery of these projects will be maximised through the government's Local Industry Capability Plan initiative. Under these plans, Defence has already let 76% of subcontractor work packages to local industry. This increasingly ensures that local suppliers, contractors and tradies have the opportunity to secure more of this work, which creates more jobs for local communities right across Western Australia. We're also significantly strengthening the Australian Industry Capability Program. And today, large prime companies competing for major contracts must must demonstrably and transparently maximise Australian industry con uh, involvement, which is so brilliantly led by my colleague here, uh, Melissa Price, who is doing an outstanding job in this area. In the FSP, the government has committed $30 billion over a decade for new infrastructure and estate works right around the nation. We recognise that infrastructure is a core enabler for our enhanced deterrent and response capabilities. Our state is home to some of Australia's most cr critical defence infrastructure, including barracks, naval facilities and air force bases, and this is set to increase. Today, half our major Navy fleet units are based here in Western Australia. And HMAS Stirling is the home port for six Anzac class frigates, a replenishment ship, Australian defence vessel Ocean Protector, all six of our Collins class submarines, embarked helicopter detachments and clearance diving team four. Sterling also accommodates over three and a half thousand defence and civilian personnel. At Henderson, West Australia continues to be a major naval sustainment centre. There at Henderson, defence undertakes significant maintenance and upgrades to our warships and also to our submarines. WA also plays a critical role in, in the nation in the National Naval Shipbuilding Enterprise as one of our two major national shipbuilding centres. WA will build at least 40 of the 70 Australian built naval vessels recently announced in the force structure plan. For example, ASC currently sustains the Collin class submarines. BAE provides engineering support and maintenance for the Anzac class frigates. Lurson and Sivamec are now building 10 Arafura class offshore patrol boats. Austral are building 21 Pacific patrol vessels and now six enhanced Cape class patrol boats. Our commitment to spend $1.5 billion for naval infrastructure and upgrades at, Henderson, at, at Stirling and also at Henderson are proceeding well. HMAS Stirling's strategic location in our region is fostering relationship building with our friends and also with our neighbours. We've also invested $97 million for the Space Surveillance Telescope in Exmouth, which was completed in May. 
Looking northwest, the Cocos Keeling Islands are set to benefit from an upgrade and refurbishment of the runway there. This will enhance our maritime domain awareness in the Indian Ocean. This $184 million project will prioritise local suppliers and create new local job opportunities. And the upgrade will support the P-8A Poseidon Maritime Surveillance and Response Aircraft. Turning to critical minerals. As many of you know, as a Senator for Western Australia, I've championed the sovereign supply of critical minerals and rare earth elements. In 2018, I led the first critical minerals delegation to Canberra to raise domestic and also global awareness of the strategic importance of this industry. That passion and commitment continues now as Minister for Defence in recognition of its importance to our military, but also to our modern economy. As a technologically superior force, the ADF remains at the competitive frontier by continually exploiting our sophisticated technologies. Among these are platforms incorporating sensors and components that require critical minerals and also rare earths. For example, each joint strike fighter includes 417 kilograms of rare earths, each and every one of them. Here in Australia, we have significant geological reserves of critical minerals and rare earth elements, and we're well placed to capitalise on rising global demand. But there is still a significant concentration of supply chains in this sector, and, and also in the capital that funds and prioritises offtake agreements. Australia is very well placed to step further into this market and bolster global supply chain security. We're working with partners to address this, including with the United States and through the Multi-Country Energy Resource Governments Initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, working with our allies and our partners is key to shaping our strategic environment. And we are strengthening cooperation with like-minded partners. Our alliance with the United States remains at the core of Australia's defence and security planning. Our alliance is based not only on the values we uphold and the interests we share, but on a high and unique degree of interoperability and collaboration. As we deepen our alliance cooperation, our focus remains squarely on the Indo-Pacific. Indeed, the United States has made clear the significant priority it places on the Indo-Pacific. And as I said last week, the United States' presence in our region has been the bedrock of regional peace and prosperity for decades, and it will continue to do so. I'm very much looking forward to progressing defence cooperation at the annual Australia-United States Ministerial Consultations, OSMIN, uh, which will be held later this year. The government also remains committed to working with the United States, India and Japan uh, under the Quad. Now looking further west from here, as uh, we do here so well, and now looking west to India, something that we have done for decades here in the west and with great admiration. India is the world's largest democracy and it is critical to the strategic balance of power in the Indo-Pacific. Trade with India is important to many regional economies, including our own. We share so much with India, our Commonwealth history, democracy, trade, and of course, the large Indian community here in Western Australia and across Australia. On the 4th of June, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Morrison and the Indian Prime Minister Modi announced a historic elevation of the India-Australia relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership. As part of the CSP, two landmark defence arrangements were agreed. Under the first, the Mutual Logistics Support Arrangement, our two countries will enhance military uh, interoperability will enhance cooperative engagement and responsiveness to regional humanitarian disasters. The second, the Science and Technology Agreement, will see greater collaboration between our respective defence sectors and also our research sectors. We've also agreed to enhance the complexity of our military exercises and engagements. These commitments further evidence that our defence relationship with India is at a historic high with our defence activities together quadrupling between 2014 and 2019. Through major exercises, including Oz Index, our navies will focus on complex anti-submarine warfare and also on interoperability to address future threats in our shared region. More than half of Australia's global trade 
including oil, crosses the Indian Ocean. Exercises like Oz Index should give Australians confidence that Australia and India share a, com a commitment to maintain freedom of navigation and the protection of crucial trade routes. The announcement of the CSP also saw Australia and India sign a memorandum of understanding on critical minerals. Australia has the geological potential to supply 20 of the 27 critical minerals important for the Indian economy. This arrangement with India will benefit Western Australia, particularly, I believe, in terms of exploration, scientific cooperation, extraction and production, and also new export opportunities. And importantly, it will further broaden our relationship with India. Australia is also committed to deepening its defence partnership with our strategic partner and close friend, Indonesia, in the Indian Ocean. During his visit to Australia in February this year, Indonesian President Joko Widodo said this. He said, Australia is Indonesia's closest friend. Indonesia and Australia must become the anchors for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region. We are great friends, represented by a comprehensive strategic partnership and our new bilateral free trade agreement, which I'm pleased to note officially came into force yesterday, in fact. Australia and Indonesia are natural partners in the Indian Ocean. We share a long maritime boundary, strong economic ties, and very strong people-to-people -people links. Australia and Indonesia's strategic outlooks are converging as we both seek to navigate our contested regional environment. Australia is committed to deepening defence partnerships with both India and Indonesia, including now exploring trilateral cooperation such as joint maritime activities. I speak regularly with Minister Prabowo and Foreign Minister Payne and I formally met with our counterparts in December of last year. We discussed our shared interests in the Indo-Pacific region, one that we believe should be open, inclusive and also prosperous. One where countries adhere to international law and agree to the rules and norms. Our CSP with Indonesia provides a framework to deepen existing military cooperation, and we are already enhancing maritime information sharing. Together, we are committed to maintaining peace, security, and also freedom of navigation and overflight in our region. The ADF and Indonesian Armed Forces now participate in 20 military exercises annually. For example, during exercise New Horizon last year, our navies undertook maritime uh, security scenarios, search and rescue activities, and also practice tactical manoeuvring. In relation to other alliances, I'm pleased to have stepped up Australia's engagement with NATO. Last month, I became the first Australian Defence Minister to attend a non-operational NATO Defence Ministers meeting. We discussed our respective uh, national responses to COVID-19 and also to the geopolitical challenges it is now presenting and I very much look forward to further cooperation uh, with NATO. France and the United Kingdom also have interests in the Indian Ocean. In 2018, Australia and France agreed a vision statement for our bilateral relationship. This includes commitments to strengthen Indian Ocean regional architecture and to cooperate more closely to bolster regional maritime security. And in May, during our quarterly defence uh, ministers meeting, French Defence Minister Parley and I reaffirmed our respective countries' commitments to our strategic defence partnership. And of course, we have close and enduring ties with the United Kingdom, one of the world's great maritime powers. Under its Global Britain strategy, the UK is taking a greater strategic interest in our region and is growing its presence in, the, in Southeast Asia and also in the Pacific. I recently convened a meeting of the Five Eyes Defence Ministers. We discussed opportunities to further strengthen our partnership, how we can work together to build resilience and address together the challenges of our increasingly complex geostrategic environment. We agreed to meet regularly to continue these productive discussions and also outcomes. So ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, as Australians, we have not changed as a people, but our world and our region has. We must adapt to these new realities. 
It is my job as Defence Minister to see the world clearly as it really is, not as we would still wish it to be. Our values are not negotiable. And as a nation, we must do more of our own heavy lifting. But the fact that the world is changing is not cause for panic, but it does call for a clear-eyed assessment of how we shape the future of our nation and also of our region. We must preserve the region's stability and the values that define us and the values that make us who we are as a people. And now our work begins to implement these changes. So Gordon, I thank you again and the Perth US Asia Centre and the University of Western Australia for having me here today. It's meetings and conversations like this that help us prepare for our changing world. And I look forward to continuing this conversation with you shortly. However, before I do, I have some very special news about the University of Western Australia. Uh, friends, for those of you who do not know, uh, last November, UWA applied uh, to the Department of Defence for a strategic policy uh, grant. Uh, Recognising the increasing strategic importance of Western Australia, the university wanted to create a defence and security program. The program is designed to leverage untapped local expertise and perspectives on issues such as the defence industry, uh, maritime security and also the Indian Ocean. So it is only fitting that I end this speech about the Indian Ocean region with the announcement that UWA was in fact successful and the department has agreed to assist fund this program. And I'm also delighted to announce that Professor Peter Dean will be the inaugural director of this program. I congratulate everybody at UWA who has contributed to this forward thinking an incredibly important program, not just for our state, but for our nation. And where are you, Professor Dean? Oh, there you are, heading down the back. And I very warmly congratulate you uh, for this position and I wish you all the best. So on that note, thank you very much again, Gordon, and thank you for your time this morning, everyone.